Today, I want to talk about what to expect when you get to the test center. In the past, I've gone into extreme depth around what you can expect on test day and how to best prepare yourself for that. But that was optimized for the old version of the GMAT. And so I wanted to update this for 2024 and the GMAT Focus Edition and also give you some advice to reflect how much larger of a role the online version of the GMAT has become in most people's preparation process. So let's dive in. Number one, and this is an inescapable and incredibly important tip and and subject to address is that a great test day starts with great preparation and that might just be painfully obvious but it's so important it, it bears repetition and if you're not sure how to dial in a great preparation process then go back a few weeks to our episode on how to start your gmat studies in 2024 and i will give you a complete rundown of what you should be doing which resources you want to engage with, depending on your specific situation. And you can feel free to reach out to us if you have questions about that on current social channels. Now, like I said, you can take the exam in person or online these days. And GMAC, the people who create the GMAT, have taken a lot of steps in recent months to basically make the online version of the exam and the in-person version of the of the exam as similar as possible in terms of policies and procedures. There are a couple important differences that I'll talk you through a little bit later, but for now, there is pretty much one set of policies that applies to the in-person and the online GMAT. This is important if you've been studying for a while because you might have seen some information and advice that like there's no waiting period between the in-person and online exam. That actually was the case for a little bit there, which was a really valuable thing to know. And lots of people leveraged it to great effect, but that's not true anymore. Now there's the standard 16-day waiting period between both versions of the exam and the score sending policies are the same now. The score reporting policies are the same etc. So I will give you the, the best advice I can about which one you should do. But uh, just so I'm not doing the cliffhanger thing, the overall advice is always take the in person version, the test center version, not the online or at home version whenever possible. There's a significantly less likelihood significantly smaller likelihood Thank goodness, sentence correction is gone everybody significantly lower likelihood of a tech issue at the test center exam. And those tech issues can be super painful. I would estimate that today there's about a 30% chance that you would have a significant tech issue on the online exam, such as the proctor accidentally interrupting your section, which could take as much as five minutes off your section time, which is like a lot. That's That's a lot of time. That's not guaranteed that that's going to happen other, but, but it, again, about 30% likelihood based on what I've seen across the last few years that GMAT online has existed. It was launched during COVID. Other tech issues that could happen is the AI that's watching you during the online exam or listening to you via the microphone and camera and your computer could flag your exam for review, which at best could take just longer to receive your score. Uh, but at worst, could could lead to your score being canceled, even if you didn't do anything wrong. And that is a, unbelievably painful, as as most of us would imagine it. It would be, and that has happened to people. And with a test center exam, everybody, there's like less than 1% chance that anything like that is going to happen. Now, it's not that every time you take it at the test center, it's going to be some super smooth, comfortable experience. But... The, the score that you get at a test center GMAT, in my personal opinion, is significantly more likely to reflect your actual ability levels or better, which is what we all want, versus the online exam, just because the online exam can have those significant tech issues. Uh, your, your exam is more likely to start late if the proctor is late. I've had that happen with students. And yeah, maybe you're that super resilient person and it's not going to phase you. But let's be honest, for most of us, it's already such a difficult situation and so stressful that why would we even add in that extra risk if we didn't have to? 
Having said all that, there are plenty of situations where the online version of the exam is awesome. I personally am super happy that GMAC introduced the online exam and has kept it around. I know a lot of students, especially all of you who live in rural areas, are extremely grateful for the online exam, and I'm grateful for it on behalf of you because there are certain situations where the online exam is just totally worth it. Again, I will go into more depth in that a little bit later. For now, that's sort of the punchline of which one should I be doing, Isaac? It's it's that. It's what I just said. Now, in either case, the week before your exam can be a really valuable time to do a couple super simple things that will help set you up for success on test day. If you're taking the exam at a test center like I just recommended for most of you, I would recommend at some point the week prior to your exam driving the actual route from your home or wherever you're going to be to the actual test center so that that is familiar or go on the bus route that you're going to take or take the Uber or taxi or whatever your situation is. Just experience what it is like to go from point A to point B. If possible, go inside the testing center and go to the actual office and step inside and take a look around. The person at the front desk is not going to like throw a fit you know you can't you can't be uh like nothing bad can happen unless you do something disruptive and that should be more than obvious but basically you can go in and just see what the whole physical situation is like and i i think that that is really helpful just for your stress levels for a lot of you and also just less processing power from your brain on test day from having to navigate a new environment like when you show up on test day it's like yeah this is what i expected and the brain just, in my personal experience, has to do a little bit less work. It's also more physically comfortable, and I think that that can lead to better performances. It's a very small thing that probably isn't going to be the difference between you getting a, a uh, you know, just okay score versus an amazing score. But it could be. It certainly could be for some of you for whom the anxiety of the situation is a big factor. For the online exam, I recommend something similar, which is do your system check requirement, and they should have sent you that information when you signed up for the online exam. If not, it's readily available on MBA.com. What the check-in process looks like, I'll, I'll walk you through that in a sec, but I'm not going to walk you through the softwares that they're going to have you use because that could get updated tonight, and then all of a sudden the advice I'm giving is like somewhat outdated, and I, I really don't want that. So that stuff is all figure outable. If you do have specific questions about that, feel free to reach out to us. But the truth of the matter is all of you are extremely capable and intelligent folks and are almost certainly going to be able to figure that out. You may have some softwares you need to install. You might have to do some updating of your operating system, that kind of stuff. Standard operating procedure for online exams. There's going to be a proprietary lockdown browser that you're going to use to take the test to make sure that you're not using Google in the middle of your test. Um, simple things like that that you can prepare in advance that just make test day go a lot smoother. Also, you will want to look at the current guidelines for your room requirements. I'll give you the basics later when I talk about the online version of the exam and what that's going to be like. But preparing the environment a couple days in advance or having a plan to prepare the environment the night before or the morning of your exam can be really valuable so that you're not having to expend a lot of brain power shifting your bookcase around in the room to make it compliant with the online exam. And there are pretty strict requirements for what you can and cannot have on your desk during the at-home GMAT, and that's as it should be. We want the playing field to be as fair as possible. Let's get into test day itself. What, what is this actual experience going to be like? I'll start with the in-person version. I'll go through that whole experience and then I'll go to the online version. So in-person first, you're going to arrive at the test center. And the first thing that you're gonna do is check in with a, a reception person who's usually behind a desk. And the first step in that process is verifying your identity. So for most places, you're going to need two forms of identification, but that's not universally true. And the forms of identification can vary depending on where in the world you are. So definitely check mba.com and dig into the website there and figure out for your specific location what forms of identification you're going to need. And definitely collect those at, at latest the night before your exam so that you're not scrambling around trying to find your passport the morning of your GMAT. That's 
irresponsible and causes unnecessary stress. After they check your ID, they are going to do a palm vein scan. So you're going to put your hand on like a, I don't even know if it's infrared technology or something like that. Maybe some of you um, biomed people can can help me out with that. It's, it's a very interesting technology. Uh, maybe it's like a mini x-ray or something, but basically it, it scans your palm vein pattern, which is apparently unique to every individual, similar to like a fingerprint or a retina scan. And that'll be logged in the computer with the little profile that'll be attached to your ID. And then they're going to take your picture. So that's pretty much what the check-in process is like when you get there. Then you will be given a key to a locker where you can put your personal items. And the most important thing to remember about that is you want to turn your phone off or put it in airplane mode, put it in the back of your locker and put as much stuff as you're going to put in the locker on top of your phone so that you are not even tempted to look at your phone or touch it during the break because your score can be canceled at a test center if you are touching your phone at any point during the exam, including the breaks. Yeah, that's really important. And that goes for smartwatches as well. After you get all your stuff stashed in your locker, then they're going to have you read the test center policies. They're going to hand you like a laminated sheet of paper. You'll sit in the waiting area and then you'll let the reception person know when you're done reading those. I guess before I move on, quick tip for your locker. I've given this in the past. In fact, I have an episode called Test Day. Uh, like I said, it is the the it's still worth listening to for the first part of it, at least because I talk a lot about smart preparation process leading up to it. But it's not essential, and that's part of the reason I'm making it for you. But I, I do go into extreme depth in terms of like techniques and snacks and stuff you can do. But the, sh the shortest piece of advice I can give for your locker outside of the phone thing that I said is put your snacks or your, your beverages, whatever you're going to have during your break, in the front of the locker so you don't have to be rummaging around in it during your break. It's, it's good to take some time in advance to do that and plan to do that. The policies are going to be pretty straightforward, the stuff that they're going to have you read. Probably not going to be too many surprises there. Basically says, like, don't stand up and start screaming in the middle of your test and disrupt everybody's test. So if you're planning on doing that, it's bad news. Not allowed. Probably going to get kicked out. Probably get your score canceled. Uh, but better that you know now, I suppose, if that was your plan. So next, you're going to check in with the proctor. And the proctor is usually not the same person who checked you in in the waiting area. The proctor is usually going to be in an area close to or separate from the waiting area. And that that proctor is going to be sitting at a computer that has a video feed of everybody who's in the test room and what they're doing to prevent cheating and nefarious activities. And then there's usually going to be like a plexiglass see-through type window into the testing room where the proctor can like watch everybody as they are taking the exam. So usually the, the proctors are fairly considerate and, and nice people, uh, not 100% of the time. So try not to let it get under your skin if, if your proctor's personality doesn't mesh with your expectations. And that's something to just be mentally prepared for. It's rare that a test center experience goes quote unquote perfectly. And it's good to just expect some discomfort, honestly. And usually that discomfort is only going to throw you off as much as you allow it to throw you off, if that makes sense. It's not going to be a big deal. But the proctor is going to hand you a whiteboard, which is not not really a whiteboard, actually, it's it's a laminated sheet of eight by 14 graph paper. And it's actually 10 sheets front and back. That's spiral bound. So you can flip through the 10 sheets. So it's kind of like 20 pieces of, of scrap paper, as it were. And then the proctor will also hand you a dry erase fine tip pen. So it's similar to a whiteboard marker, but it's very fine tip. And so the experience is very similar to writing on pen and paper. I don't think it's too shocking for most people, but you can web search GMAT simulation pad and you can get a simulator for your last couple practice tests if you want to. A lot of people ask me a lot of questions about this. I would not use it as you're studying. I would not use it for your early exams because it smears quite easily and it's it's really annoying and it's very helpful to be able to go back and look at your scratch work after the fact when you're studying and taking practice exams. So if you want to be a little extra prepared for test day, then you can use that simulation pad for your last two practice tests, and that should be more than enough. What I recommend there is just do a quick check of the pen to make sure it's not dried out. So uncap the pen and do a little squiggly or line or something on the scrap pad. 
before you begin the palm vein scan of going into the test room, because if your pen is dry, the time to swap it out is before you enter into the test room and start the exam and then realize your pen's dry and you need a new one. That's, that's a bummer. So quick tip there. At that point, the proctor will ask you to put your hand on the palm vein scanner and that will scan your palm vein to make sure you're the same person who checked in. And then my experience has been the proctor will ask you to turn any pockets that you might have inside out in your coat or sweatshirt, just to make sure you don't have anything that's not allowed in the testing room. Real quick on that point, the only thing you're allowed to bring into the testing room with you for the in-person exam is the key to your locker and your ID. So you're not allowed to have water, not allowed to have snacks, none of that unless it's been pre-approved in advance by GMAC. And usually what that means is you have a note from a medical professional that says you need to have X, Y, and Z thing with you in the testing room. So that's not going to apply to most of us. I have heard some exceptions if you have testing accommodations with your own private room. Some proctors in the private room are okay with water. Others aren't. Technically, it is not allowed. At that point, the proctor will escort you to the terminal that you will be taking the test on. And usually it's a somewhat, somewhat old computer, <laughs> let's say between five and 10 years old, with a keyboard and a mouse. And that's how your exam is going to be administered. And you will have a cubicle style workspace. It's not a full cubicle. It's a desk with two with a sound panel on your left and right to separate you from the person who's sitting next to you. And it's it's enough I, in my experience. I, I honestly haven't had too many people complain about noise at the test center. Most people are quite respectful. At the in-person test center, you will typically have access to earplugs and in some cases over-the-ear headphones, and you can call your test center that you're taking the exam at in advance to see what of those noise blocking items will be available. Sometimes they'll let you bring your own ear earplugs if you show them to the proctor or the check-in person in advance, but most test centers in my experience are not going to allow you to use your own earplugs and are going to either insist that you use their earplugs or the over-the-ear headphones that they have if they don't have earplugs available. So a quick call in advance can help you figure out what's going to be available to you. And if you're worried about sound distracting you, then I would recommend that. And I would recommend simulating that with your practice exams as well. Because the first time I took a practice exam with earplugs, I was really distracted by how clearly I could hear my own breathing with the earplugs in. And it was super weird. But then I got used to it. And then actually, it was helpful on test day, because I could sort of zone in on that. And it helped me block out some of the ambient noise in the test center that otherwise could have been potentially a little bit distracting. So that's what to expect there. Once the proctor has walked you over to your terminal and you have sat down, the proctor will put in his or her own unique login code that then allows you to access the exam. And at that point, the proctor will walk away and you will be able to start your exam. Now, don't stress, there is a short instruction screen that's just going to have like this is what a problem solving question is. This is what data sufficiency is, that kind of thing where you'll click through. And I believe you have two minutes to go through that. That might change everybody. Just, you know, it might be a week or two weeks since I'm publishing this until you listen to it. It, it might be a year. Um, and I want you to know like those kinds of small things can change. But last I checked, it was two minutes. So you can expect something similar to that. And during that time, technically, you're not allowed to write anything on your scratch pad, just FYI. So if you're planning on doing like a timing strategy with the scratch pad, then I would wait until the section starts to be fully compliant. So you can use that instruction screen to kind of take a deep breath or center yourself in the room if you have a system or, or practice you like to use, or you can just click I understand and then move to the beginning of the exam. At that point, you will be able to choose the order in which you want to take the test. And as of now, any order of the three sections is possible. So I could do quant, then verbal, then data insights. I could do verbal, then quant, then data insights. I could do 
verbal than data insights than quant and all the different permutations of those those orderings and ideally you have practiced in advance with a, a section order that you're comfortable with or you've experimented to figure out what you're comfortable with and if you haven't been doing that on your practice test then i strongly recommend you begin thinking about that and experimenting and figuring out what works best for you so that you can make a quick confident decision in that moment that'll also include where you will take the break. You can take the break after the first section or after the second section, irrespective of which order you choose, but you will not choose when you take the break at the beginning. I want to be clear about that. At the beginning of the exam, which is where we are in the timeline of what happens when you get to the test center right now, you will just choose the section order that you want to take, and then you'll be prompted to take your break after the first section. If you decline, then it'll start the second section, and then you'll be prompted again after the second section and say, do you want to take your break? So that's that. If you have any questions about that, let us know. But hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory and also hopefully very familiar from your practice exams if you've taken the MBA.com practice exams, which ideally you should have taken at least one of those before going to the test center and taking your test. At that point, the first section will begin. And hopefully that is also super, super familiar to you from your prep. There will typically be a short instruction screen that says like, hey, this is this section, this is what's happening in this, like, this is data insights, this is the data insights section, this is what you're about to take, these are the rules of the road, this is X, Y, and Z, what you can and can't do. And again, that should be very familiar from the practice tests. And if you've prepared at all, you should be very familiar with what you're going to see in, in the data insights section and in the quant section, etc. Again, technically, you're not supposed to be writing anything down during that instruction screen. So I would not recommend writing anything down. Now, once you click through that, which I believe is one minute, 59 seconds, then you will be able to start writing on the scratch pad and you'll be looking at the first question in the section. So if you have a scrap paper technique or you want to write a positive affirmation, I don't, I don't know what you're using on your scratch pad. There's a lot of advice out there and there's definitely different strokes for different folks. You can take that time, first 20, 30 seconds of the section or whatever to set up your scrap paper however you want. Or if you don't have some scrap paper technique, then you can just dive into the first question and you can execute your game plan for that section. Then that section will end and it'll say, do you want to take your break? And then you'll have a moment to choose whether you want to take the break at that moment or not. My advice is to practice in advance and figure out whether you want to take the break after the first section or after the second section. Let's just pretend you're going to take it after the first section so I can walk you through what that looks like. But hopefully you understand that you might just roll right into the second section at that point and then take it, take your break after the first section. First and most important piece of advice about the break is take it. Absolutely take the break unless you've been not taking the break in practice and having tons of success with that. If that's you, you're in a very rare category. Most people are going to benefit from taking the break. So plan to take the break. When you do decide to take your break, you will have to raise your hand and wait for the proctor to notice you walk into the room to your terminal and log you out of your terminal with his or her unique password. You're not supposed to just stand up and walk out of the test center when you start your break. So that will eat up some of your break time. And that can be a little bit of a bummer, honestly. But the proctor will come in, log you out, escort you out of the test, test room, and then scan your palm veins. And at that point, your break actually begins. So that's hopefully not more than 30 seconds, but it could be one to two minutes of your, as of now, 10 minute break. And then what you will do is you will have the remaining time of the break to go to your locker, get your food and snack, use the restroom if you want, et cetera. You can just do your break routine. Hopefully that's well rehearsed what you wanna do. And quick tip, I would actually recommend either at your initial visit to the to the test center prior to test day, checking out where the restroom is because it's usually not in the office that you're going to be taking the test in. Sometimes it is, but usually it's not. You might have to go down the hall to a restroom that all the offices on that floor share. So just something to be advised of. If you haven't done that in advance, then when you check in on test day, I would recommend figuring out where the restroom is before your test begins. Okay, so you're on break now. Some Test centers do not have a clock that you can use to keep track of your break. So 
if you've scouted out your test center and you know there isn't going to be a clock, then I would recommend having a non-smart watch, like a stopwatch or a regular wristwatch that you bring to the test center with you, put it in the front of your locker before the exam begins so that you can time your own break. Otherwise, if you're late from your break, that's going to be deducted from your section time, your next section time, and that's potentially going to be really stressful and not be what you want. On the break, quick recommendations for snacks, whatever you like, honestly, is the best recommendation there and whatever you've had the most success with in practice. Having said that, if you're really not sure what to do, then hopefully you have a solid meal one to two hours before your test begins. Something with protein, carbohydrates, and vegetables for your micronutrients. If you're really not sure what to do, that's what I recommend. And then during the break, something with some dissolved sugar in it can be good. So like... um half a sports drink or half of like a soda with some dissolved sugar. If you like caffeine, you know, that could be a good time to have something like that. But I'd, I wouldn't recommend drinking a whole large container of that. Otherwise, you might have to use the restroom during the next section or just be really uncomfortable, which is a bummer. So something like a half or quarter portion of that can be good because most of our brains are running on simple sugars and dissolved sugar is the fastest way to replace the brain's glucose supply, which can help your performance in the next section, all else being equal. So at that point, your break, your actual like break time where you're chilling out, able to relax is probably going to be like six to eight minutes of the actual like 10 minute quote unquote scheduled break, because then you're going to have to go back to the proctor. The proctor is going to ask you to turn your pockets inside out, scan your palm veins, walk you over to your terminal, and then put the password in to log you back into your terminal. And that's when your break ends and the next section begins. So that checkout check-in for the break can be up to two minutes on either side. And it's good to just plan for the worst there. And you might want to simulate that when you're doing your tests at home. So that's the break. The rest of the test should be pretty familiar. If you've done your, your studying and preparation the proper way, you execute your plan for the second section, and then there'll be a little blip instruction screen, and then the third section begins. At that point, you will see a, a something on the screen as the test calculates your score, and then bam, you will get your what's called unofficial score. Now, I get a lot of questions about this. The unofficial score that you see immediately after you complete the exam is, for all intents and purposes, your official score on the GMAT. It's exceptionally rare that there will be any deviation between your unofficial score and your official score. Having said that, it can take a few days to populate your quote unquote official score in your online dashboard. And at that point, be able to be sent to schools after the fact. You now send whichever score that you want to send. And that's different than the past. In the past, I had to send every score on my report. Now they allow you to send any individual score. For now, that's pretty much test A at the test center. I'll walk you through the differences between that and the online exam in a sec. For now, if you have questions about the test center, feel free to reach out anytime. If you want an even more in-depth conversation about what to do before leading up to and at the test center, then check out our previous Test A pod episode from, I think, five years back now. And I will walk you through in exceptional detail <laughs> tons and tons and tons of advice that's even more in-depth. But I wanted to keep this one a little bit more succinct and a little higher level. So that if you're just looking for, hey, what do I expect on test day, you can jump right into it and hopefully have some valuable clarity. Let's pivot to the online exam. A lot of this stuff is going to be the same, but there's a couple important differences. Number one, you're not allowed to wear earplugs or coverings over your ears at all during the online or at home exam. And so you'll definitely want to plan to be in a quiet environment if you're worried about being distracted by sound. And you can't have anything covering your ears either, like a scarf or a hood. There might be pre-approval processes if you have specific beliefs that require you to wear stuff over your ears. I'm not an expert on those specific belief systems and how GMAC deals with them. You should reach out to GMAC either via live chat on mba.com or over a phone call or support ticket to get clarity on that if you wind up being in that situation. And you should definitely get ahead of that if that's you. Having said that, you are allowed to have water on your desk for the at-home exam. 
and you are not generally allowed to have water in the test center exam while you're taking the test. So if that's a big deciding factor for you, that could be a reason to take the online exam rather than the test center exam. And I said there are specific situations, and if the water thing is a big deal for you, that could be a deciding factor. And for many of you, that'll overcome the potential of a tech issue, and that's totally cool. Now, there's also a difference in the whiteboard, and I'm going to bring this up now because you're going to want to get ahead of this if you're taking the online exam. There's a digital whiteboard you can use for the online GMAT, or you can get your own physical whiteboard. As of now, the physical whiteboard dimensions that are allowed are less than 12 inches by 20 inches. I am in the U.S. I am sorry that I am not on the metric system. <laughs> so hopefully you can do a quick conversion to millimeters or centimeters if that's your, your more comfortable way of conceptualizing things. But my recommendation is get, get that whiteboard in advance. There are some restrictions on the whiteboard that are on the policies page on mba.com. And then I would get a as fine tip as possible, super fine tip dry erase marker to use on that whiteboard. And then you're allowed to have an eraser as well that you will definitely want. You'll definitely want a good eraser because you're going to be erasing like every one to three problems because the whiteboard's going to be kind of small. And you can have that whiteboard on your desk, similar to like a scratch pad during the exam. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend using the physical whiteboard. The digital whiteboard is a huge pain in the neck in my experience. It's very clunky, it's very difficult to use. Some people like the digital whiteboard for the verbal section because they can type their notes rather than physically handwriting them. I personally have found a lot more success with my students having them physically write the notes, even for verbal, on the physical whiteboard and never using the digital whiteboard. Having said that, it is available. You can preview it during your practice tests. And if that's something that you wanna use, figure out what your system's gonna be for that before test day, okay? But I, I recommend getting the physical whiteboard and practicing with that for your final two practice exams, just like I was talking about with the simulation pad for the in-person exam a moment ago. If you have questions about the whiteboard or how things are changing, just let us know, but hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory. You get your own in advance, you get your own pen, you get your own eraser and you will erase it after each section. That brings me to a valuable point about the test center whiteboard and, and scratch pad, which I did go into extreme depth in on the old episode, but just real quick, you can, you can have as many of those as you need throughout the in-person exam, but you can only have one at a time. So I recommend swapping out your whiteboard at the test center after each section. That'll usually be enough for most people. For the online exam, you're not going to have to worry about that because you just erase the whiteboard with your eraser. But erasing the whiteboard you get for the in-person exam is generally impractical and annoying. So just wanted to uh, insert that. I think that's helpful to know. So at this point, you will start the exam on on quote unquote test day for the online exam so you will you will be in the room that you're going to be in and have that fully prepped at least 30 minutes in advance of your exam starting 15 minutes in advance of your exam starting you'll log into your mba.com account and you will see the option to quote unquote launch your online exam that option will not be available earlier than that. That's the official policy as of now. In the past, it's been 30 minutes, so that could change, but 15 to 30 minutes before the exam, you'll be able to log in. And your proctor should be there 15 minutes before your scheduled exam time. Having said that, proctors can run late with the online exam. And that's why I was saying I strongly recommend taking the test center version just in case. Proctors have been 30 minutes late, 45 minutes late. Hopefully that's not going to happen. Like I said, probably 70% chance everything's going to go smoothly. In a perfect world, you're Proctor is there 15 minutes before your scheduled exam time. You are there 15 minutes before your scheduled exam time, and then you can start the check-in process. This is very similar to the in-person exam. First thing is check your ID with the proctor, verify your identity, and then they're going to ask you to take your webcam or your camera attached to your laptop computer and pan it around the room and show your desk to make sure that it's compliant with all the policies. That's why I was recommending you look into those policies and make sure that your room is compliant the week leading up to your exam so that you're not having to stress about that on test day. Once the scan is complete, 
you will then be asked to review the policies and then the proctor is going to begin your exam. Now, another reason I don't recommend the online exam is that there's a lot more variance from proctor to proctor in terms of the order in which they take you through this process, how strictly they follow the process. So there can be some variance here, everybody. And you might not see all of the things I just talked to you through, or you might see some other things that the proctor might ask you to rearrange something on your desk or change something in your room or your environment. So you should be mentally prepared to deal with that variance if you're going to take the online exam. Again, that might still make it worth it for you to take it online, but you should just expect it. I think if you know what to expect, if you're properly prepared, then it's unlikely, unlikely to throw you off. Okay, then your exam begins, and it's pretty much the same as what I just walked you through. You'll see the instructions, you'll choose the order in which you want to take the section, you will take the test and execute your game plan. The break works pretty much exactly the same way. Your proctor will just ask you to erase your whiteboard before the break begins, and then you can be off camera and leave the room during your break, but you cannot be off camera at any point while you're taking the test. Just like at the test center, you're not allowed to like get up and walk around the test room to like blow off some steam. <laughs> the proctor is going to be like, hey, I need you to either be sitting at the terminal taking the test or out of the test room. Okay, so that's fairly similar. So expect to be in the room at home where you're taking the exam while the test is proceeding. But during the break, you can leave the room and take your break and do, and do your thing. All right, so let me walk you through some general policies that apply to both exams and then how to deal with your scores. Again, if you leave, the clock keeps running. So if you decide that you, you can get up and, and leave the testing room in the test center if you need to use the restroom in the middle of the section, but the clock's going to keep running, that's not advisable. You're going to have some serious problems doing that during the online exam. Like your score could get canceled. The proctor could stop your exam. You, you are supposed to be on camera during the whole section during the online exam. As of now, this could change, okay? Just quick tips. You're prepared for that. And again, if you're late from the break, the clock also keeps running. So just keep that in mind. That applies to both exams. Let's talk about scores. And once it populates in your dashboard on mba.com, they'll send you an email and then you'll have 48 hours to send up to five schools, again, included in the cost of your exam. If you want to send to more than five schools or you want to wait for longer and then you decide after 72 hours to send your scores, there's a small fee. And I don't know exactly what that is today. In the past, it's been around $20 per school. That might have changed in recent years and it, it might change between now and six months from now, which is why I didn't just look it up and, and tell you what it is. But it's going to be somewhere in that range. And... Those are, those are the score sending policies and what I recommend. Last tip on scores, they're valid for five years, which means you can take the GMAT, not do anything for three years, and then apply to business school and you don't have to retake the exam. That's the rundown of test day. If I missed anything, if you have any additional questions, shoot us a DM on current social channels and we will do our best to address that in future content. As always, my greatest hope is that this material will make your studies as easy and as painless as they can possibly be. If you want more tips and strategies for optimizing your performance on the GMAT, head to our website, thegmatstrategy.com, which is linked in the description of this episode, and check out our free video on how to achieve your dream GMAT score in half the normal time. In the meantime, this is a weekly show, so please subscribe, and as always, stay positive and stay consistent with your studies. I'll talk to you all soon.